We're Hello. Live. Hello. No one's watching yet. We are here. We are here at uh, with Zero Books Basement, uh, and we are here to read to all you people. Not to read to you. It's not what we're doing. Uh, we are here to discuss. No one's watching. Literally, no one is watching yet. <laughs> oh. Okay. Yeah. Now we have one, we're one viewer. Yeah. So we will now. We, now we can start. <laughs> okay. Well, we are. Yeah. Now we can start. Now we have we have six viewers. Viewer. Okay. So okay. Now we're going. Hello. Uh, we are here with Zero Books Basement, uh, and we are here to discuss uh, Chapter Sixteen of Capital: Absolute and Relative Surplus Value. Uh, it's a short chapter, so we'll have lots of time for riffing today, which I know you guys love, you know, because we're so good for comic relief and general therapy. Uh, I see that we've already been accused of being noobs, noobs. Uh, by an unnamed uh, Facebook user, so we're off to a great start here. Uh, I hope, <laughs> hope that the caliber of the contributions will remain at that level uh, throughout the two hours here. Uh, so how, how's everyone doing? How is uh, how, how are you doing, Elliot? How are you doing, Ernesto? I'm doing very I'm doing well. doing good. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, my 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 weekend's going nice. I had a really uh, nice Saturday. I I just walked and I had so much um I had so much stamina just because I was so glad to not be at work. Um, because our our relative surplus value has been cranked has been actually I can materially tell you uh, our 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 requirements are have been increased by roughly forty percent mm -hmm. um, productivity. Okay. Uh, to produce to produce surplus value due to furloughs, mm -hmm. so um, now we're so it's fucking exhausting. Oh my god, everybody, everybody is exhausted. Uh, Are you talking about therapy? I am talking about therapy. You have to. You have to do more therapy. Well, as as Mark says in the in the chapter, in terms of whether it's you're the schoolmaster, mm -hmm. you're the you're the factory worker. He yeah. takes a different view than I think Doug has, which he likes to divide up a, a bit with the petty bourgeois accusations of teachers' assistants, but Marx doesn't do that. Um, we'll we'll yeah, get into that. Yeah. Like, well, you're a therapist, a school master, but yeah, et cetera. Yeah, we so should, our should... relative surplus value is cranked up. So you're you're doing you're doing what you're saying is that you're dealing with more patients in a shorter in a, in the same period of time. There's a greater density of treatment that's required. We actually have literally a mathematically impossible productivity requirement. Okay, uh, of course. And it requires unpaid overtime essentially. Uh, okay, you know. which would be which would be absolute uh, surplus value, right? Because then if the time's extended. Yeah, it, yeah, it does. You're right. So that that's increased slightly as well. <laughs> all sides, all sides. Mm -hmm. yeah. And how are you doing, Ernesto? How are you doing? Well, I'm doing fine. Um, I'm seeing a lot of the same phenomenon. Uh, the factory. We've uh, have to had to pick up the orders from our competitor competitors who are not working right now. Okay. And uh, some of our clients work in the um, healthcare, and they make panels for wall panels for hospitals, right? Okay. Um, some of them make machines, valves, stuff like that, and we've had to intensify our labor as well. But um, as I showed you guys uh, earlier uh, about a week or two ago we've uh, we've gone from the formal uh no is it the formal or the how's the what's the distinction for marks um absolute surplus value no of course yeah obviously absolute and relative but i mean from the control of capital oh uh real subsumption and formal subsumption thank you yeah, yeah. real subsumption we've, is the deep that's the right deep, deep, deep right control right yeah. right right so we've we've gone from the from our real sub subsumption where we were working with a certain kind of machinery and we've implemented new machinery which uh, changes the way we work and we've been thinking about starting a night shift now that we have the machinery that allows us to extend the labor day. So mm -hmm. it's a uh, it's 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 uh, confusing and intriguing and worrying seeing this live during the pandemic you know mm -hmm. what i mean mm -hmm. well the, the 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 real subsumption formal subsumption divide like a lot of them like marx isn't so specific about periodization in a lot of parts of capital which i think is yeah. because like this very hegelian you know changes in quantity becomes changes in quality um it can be because i think he wants to acknowledge that it can be hard to pin down when something becomes something else 
Mm -hmm. um, that often it's, it's a metamorphosis uh, and, and language can, can or, or categories sometimes don't do justice to that. Mm -hmm. So I think the, the real and the real and formal subsumption difference, you know, can be certainly interpreted differently. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you talked about your factory making the shift from formal to real subsumption based on. So, you know, and I think when Marx talks about, um, you know, formal subsumption, he's talking about a, a context in which the labor process itself is really not affected by the mm -hmm. the injunctions of the capitalist system. Um, but but then it's like, what does that mean exactly? Right. You know, I mean, we can give a very obvious example, right, where we can say, like, you know, I don't know, like, uh people working in in really traditional forms of peasant agriculture right mm -hmm. and they're just kicking up you know uh, a surplus value or social surplus product to um you know to capitalists who own it right mm -hmm. so that's kind of clear but then it's like at what point would you say that the you know what exact point would you say that the labor process becomes enclosed by by the injunctions of of capital right well I think, in, this, I think in, in this case for example um our carpenters they usually are trained in mm -hmm. the design of the pallets that they're making. Mm -hmm. And with these machines, you don't need to train anybody anymore. You can just tell person A, grab this lever, pull it, and press a button. That's it. Okay. So there's been a a, a real transformation, I think, in the way okay. labor even happens in the factory okay. now. So you're definitely interpreting you're definitely interpreting real subsumption as coinciding with a shift to the favoritization of of uh, relative surplus value then. Is yeah. What you're saying. Yeah. Okay. Which I think is fair, like as a way of trying to interpret it. Yeah. I think um, I think another thing that's articulated in this chapter that is, like you said, Conrad, he like kind of he outlines the concepts, but he has all these asides sort of. Mm -hmm. Um what it was interesting, I think it was articulated before in Capital, but the fact that labor is the process which makes nature nature into the human. Um which which is already articulated elsewhere, but is like succinctly stated here. So that's, that's kind of an interesting. I'd be curious hmm? to know what passage you're referencing, but can I just try to summarize the chapter before we continue? Just yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry, sorry. Okay, good idea. Um, yeah, yeah, so yeah, this yeah, is yeah, chapter yeah. sixteen. Uh, <laughs> it's at the beginning of the section on the production of absolute and relative surplus value, and chapter sixteen is simply called absolute and relative surplus value. I mean, actually, I, I find this to be mostly. Uh, a sort of preliminary to a larger discussion about absolute and relative surplus value. Mm -hmm. um, because what, you know, Marx sets out here, uh, he talks about, um, you know, the way that people encounter nature. He wants to delineate the specificity of surplus value production or extraction uh, versus use value production. Um, and then he talks about the distinction between productive and unproductive labor, as it's taken up, for instance, in classical political economy um briefly delineates the distinction between absolute and relative surplus value um so we can say that again absolute surplus value is surplus value that derives from the extension of labor time right or the work day mm -hmm. uh, whereas relative surplus value uh derives from uh the increasing of its productivity or intensification right yeah, through changing magnitudes changing the the methods or the tools for example um and then actually what what much of the chapter and you know this is a very important theme for marx through capital uh, he goes into a critique of uh classical political economy and also mill uh because of their transhistoricization and naturalization uh of the way uh that uh surplus value is extracted so in otherwise in other words they fail to grasp uh the particularity of the capitalist or bourgeois mode of production so it's, it's because of that i think you have to understand this as a kind of scaffolding mm -hmm. right that's going to sustain uh, uh, the subsequent, um, it's a, a preliminary to the subsequent increase uh, yeah. that are going to occur. Uh, so any, any thoughts on that, by the way? Yeah, Elliot, you were talking about the, the idea, because Mark starts out here and he talks about well, man, yeah, man yeah. and nature, right? Yeah. It's, I, you know, embarrassingly, it's the first sentence. <laughs> Not that I look, but, he, but he articulates it. Um, he says, in considering the labor process, we begin by treating it in the abstract apart from its historical forms as a process between man and nature. But then he says, a single man cannot operate upon nature without calling his own muscles into play under the control of his own brain. As in the natural body, head, and hand wait upon each other, so the labor process unites the labor of the hand with that of the head. Later, they part company and even become deadly foes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. So this so is yeah, still quite, quite ambiguous. It's, so it's, classic. 
quite ambiguous <laughs> in terms of the production of the human, but I think what it does clarify. So Marx is talking about the way that, um, you know, when we, as individuals, for example, yeah. and again, I, I want to stress that there's a real question as to what extent any of this is like historical or sort of, um, you know, schematical. Um, but the idea being that like when you, uh, when you're engaged in, in labor, let's say, uh, that's just producing use values when you don't exist in a context in which surplus value is extracted, that you direct your own activity, right? Mm -hmm. um, whereas, you know, subsequently what occurs is you become directed uh, through a labor process uh, in which you're producing um, surplus labor or social surplus product for some you're, for someone else. And then you become sub subordinated to that kind of command structure. So there's a distinction between head and hand uh, that manifests in that way. And again, very interesting because here is where I'm not going to get into this too much, but here's where Son Rethel takes it up and argues that like philosophy itself can is because is based on a kind of structural distinction, right? Between like abstract essences and sort of material content, right? The archa in ancient Greek, so that it presupposes the development of this process, right? So even the, the, the notion of universal abstraction can't take hold until there's tangible um, changes in our material existence, right? Yeah. Which is crazy. What do you got? Any thoughts? Yeah. On that? Well, yeah. Well, what, you know, what, yeah, what the idea is in terms of like, there's so many, there's so many different ways to know an idea in the abstract and the, and the, the lay notions and to, to do the process of philosophy is to see, um, to a certain extent, what is the nature of the idea? What are the contradictions within the idea? What are the forces within the idea? Um, you know, Hegel has his theories and Deleuze has um, his theories of, um, you know, the idea is sort of split with all these different multiplicities of negatives. Um, so in terms of like the human, like if you look at the human, mm -hmm. what's the human? There's nature. There's also animal. Mm -hmm. um, there's also robot, you could say, automaton. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There's also um, will and non-will, the will of the other, the dream of the other. Like, I'm not sure he says that, but partic but you can do Deleuzian, um, you know, engagement with the idea, right? Um, mm -hmm. so what are the negatives of the, in, of mm -hmm. the yeah. Yeah, so, well, yeah. I, guess, I guess the more specific claim that, like, I was interested in is the idea that the notion of the the person as we understand it, or the human, that it develops through participation in a process that uh, generates value, right? Um, so in other words, that there's like, like what we call nature is anything that rests outside of that. So there's a naturalization of, for example, women who don't produce exchange value, right? And then you kind of look at something like Me Too and it's like, well, you know, this, uh, if you look at what it's dealing with, it's like, okay, well, people are just, you know, it's like, okay, I, I can just take that. It's just there, right? You know, and there's a kind of, I think there's a similarity. You can look at the naturalization of women as a historical notion, but I think there's a similarity between the idea that you can just take nature or you can just take a woman who's there, right? Um, that it's something that's just, because it's just appropriated, right? The, like the, what they create is just appropriated traditionally, right? Mm -hmm. um, without uh, uh, entrancing the sort of circle of value in a direct way. Well, true. I mean, but now, I mean, you see that extraterrestrial, excess terrestrial says, says <laughs> the woman commentator. <laughs> I like that. That's funny. <laughs> um, but yeah, in terms of the woman as the as the reappropriated to a certain extent, I mean. But then there's also the tendency against that, which you could say is is the Hillary Geist, which is then reacted against. Um, yeah, very complicated negatives when once you get involved in woman, and then of course Lacan says you don't even women don't even exist. <laughs> Because the but then he's he's pointing to a specific quality which is the elusiveness of femininity and its uh, sexual position or whatever. Well, and you could but you could, it's actually it's interesting because you could also argue that you could also argue that that use value doesn't exist, yeah. right? And what I mean by that is like what would like what could use value conceivably designate if we didn't have exchange value, right? Like it, its meaning yeah. is only acquired in relation to that, which is what Lacan is saying about uh, la femme n'existe pas, right? This is what mm -hmm. he's saying. Uh, when he says that. Um, so I think women acquire their identity, um, you know, in the way which has been so productive, right, for people like uh, Iragare and Kristeva. But the identity is acquired relationally in the same way that nature acquires its identity only relationally. 
right? Uh, or use value acquires its identity only relationally. It's just a designate. It's like, I mean, Zizek says this about asiotic mode of production. It's like, this is just something that's like outside, you know, it designates an exteriority, right? So that is, that is. Designates an exteriority. Yeah, yeah. So we're already, we're already totally off topic. Totally. In no, the, this is on topic. We're, we're extrapolating okay. from the head to hand. This is good. Yeah. Uh, but then we get then we get a thing on productive labor, right? What what yeah. is what is productive labor? I thought yeah. that was really interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I see a lot of Marxists that seem to say that if you are not working in a factory, you're not being productive. Which, I mean, I understand mm -hmm. uh, the point, but it's not just the transformation of nature, right? It's about sustainment of humanity. Uh you're 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 saying it's about like can you repeat what you're saying yeah that it's a, that it's not just about the transformation of nature it's how that is incorporated into sustainment of humanity because you can't uh value labor time without understanding what goes into sustaining labor mm -hmm. yeah absolutely i i think like my actual sense of this passage uh and mark says here uh, mm -hmm. What's interesting is that when he goes over it, and this is often really held up in like workerist interpretations of Marxism, where people are yeah, like, exactly. yeah, you're, you're doing unproductive labor. Mm -hmm. um, well, like, first of all, like, keep in mind that Marx here says that teachers are unproductive, but he advocated the establishment of universal education and like was championed it, you know, so obviously he doesn't think that it's just equatable with ir irrelevancy, right? Um, but also he kind of qualifies what he's saying, right? Because he says that... Uh, he, he talks about it in relationship with political economy. And he says in volume four of this work, which I hate to break it to you guys, it never happened. Um, <laughs> in volume four of this work, uh, he says, we'll deal with the history of the theory. We shall show that classical political economists always made the production of surplus value the distinguishing characteristic of the productive worker. Hence, their definition of a productive worker varies with the conception of the nature of surplus value. Thus, the physiocrats insist that only agricultural labor is productive. Since that alone, they say, yields a surplus value. For the physiocrats, indeed, surplus value exists exclusively in the form of ground rent. So he's using the physiocratic example as a kind of, you know, absurd benchmark, right, of what this could represent. But the point is, he's actually situating himself kind of a little bit outside this discourse. Because he's saying like that, you know, classical political economy has the tendency to do this. Um, so I don't know, like, there's a good question here as to how analytically you can really take any, anything he's saying. Um, what does he say here? The only work, so he says the only worker is productive is one who produces surplus value for the capitalist. But then he's like, oh, well, that's how it's conceptualized in, in classical political economy. So I, I don't really know how useful that that language is or because it's a bit misleading. Um, I mean, obviously, I get what he's saying. He's saying like productive just has to mean directly productive of surplus value. Right. Yeah. But then you have all other kinds of things which are conditions of surplus value production. Right, like obviously yeah. educating people assists in surplus value. You know, obviously having transit workers and all of this, it's all part of that, right? So Marx would never dismiss the essentiality of those things. Um, but he's in a bit of an ambiguous position as well, because I think one thing that is characteristic of our time that was less characteristic of his. So like the reason that, uh, the reason that the, the classical political economists love the productive unproductive distinction is because they like, they hated on like the aristocrats and they were like, oh, those fuckers, they're not productive. Uh, of course, Marx likes to point out that capitalists themselves aren't productive by the same <laughs> benchmark. Yeah. But, okay, like, uh, the point well, I mean, is... The, capital, the capitalist creates the negative of the aristocrat to feel productive, to feel like they're doing work, right? To feel like yeah. the laborer. And then the laborer sort of points to the, the capitalist, and then they're both in the same sort of negative of themselves. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Everyone has to inframe themselves in a certain way. That makes mm -hmm. them feel like they're justified, and the aristocrats, of course, and frame themselves as like you know instruments of God or some shit like that, or, or the ones who keep order, right? From the you know from the you know the vulgar masses or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. one thing one thing about this though, which I think is interesting too, is like that. So in in Marx's time, like a lot of the people who you would have said don't form productive labor, right? Uh, were, like you did have like a lot of like, you know, people who existed because of patriarchal structures, aristocrats and so forth. I think in a modern capitalist economy, right, a lot of what we would call like unproductive labor has been structured in such a way that it's directly linked to uh, the, the exigencies of productive labor. Right. Um, yeah. So I think it, the context changes 
Um, so I think that can explain why he's a little bit equivocal about that as well. Because the, in that time, especially the relation, like even the indirect function of assistance. Um, I mean, in many cases, you could argue that unproductive labor in this time would have been antagonistic uh, towards uh, capitalist production itself, which is like Ricardo's point, right? Does that make sense, sort of? Yeah, so the idea is that un unproductive labor... Yeah, yeah, make... <laughs> like it okay. could or couldn't be, it may or may not be. Not, I realized I was about to just say the exact same thing you said. <laughs> and that's well, that's good, myself. that's good. It, it may or may not be directly <laughs> assistive to, it may or may not be directly assistive to, uh, to production, right? Like I think in, you know, I think in less developed countries today, it's less connected to it generally. I think like in Canada or something, it's, it's quite directly connected to it in most cases, right? Because that's kind of what you do in a capitalist economy. You want to organize. So we have a mixed, mixed economy. So like, you know, we recognize yeah. the need for this, but you want to organize it so that everything is kind of structured to support, ideally to support sort of the valorization of capital, right? Indirectly. If need be. Yeah. So Conrad, unproductive labor is labor that doesn't that produces less relative surplus value viewed as unproductive labor. I know there's a specific definition and I'm vulgarizing, so I'm asking you. It is labor that <laughs> it is labor that does not produce surplus value. Or doesn't produce any surplus value. No, okay. no. Like it like it may create and generate the conditions. Right? Yeah. yeah. You know, this this is kind of this is like a little bit complicated though i mean surplus value here gets a little bit because the, the problem is like like i think you can what i said is correct but the problem is like okay like if we take a if we take a, a government teacher right and it's like the basic problem with this is like you could argue that they produce surplus value in some sense but you would just have to really blur the lines as to what surplus value is and make very, very abstract yeah. speculations about how it manifests. So it doesn't have any direct, this is why I keep using the word direct. It doesn't have any direct function that way, right? Yeah, direct function in terms of value, surplus value production. Uh, yeah, it doesn't have a, a direct. So just by the way, I think this can be helpful. Um, Mia Gonzalez, yeah. like the Marxist feminist who's associated with EndNotes and, and the California yeah. scene, and of course, you know, Commune Magazine just got shut down, which maybe we should talk about later. Yeah, but, got, uh, got, got hashtag canceled. Yeah. Uh, oh, later. Yeah. Sure. We'll we'll discuss it later. Yeah. I, I'm get, By the way, I'm going to answer this question. Oh, could we have an example of unproductive labor? Um, like I just said, like a, a teacher, if they're not if they're not in the private sector, would be unproductive labor because they don't create surplus value. Right. Like they're you know that's not the function of what they're doing. Right. The government but, is taxing sectors that create surplus value to provide something which is necessary to the production of surplus value, but indirectly. Right. Yeah. Now, now, Conrad, I've been watching a lot of Chinese TV, and this is how they this is how they do the cutscenes. <laughs> so, Conrad. <laughs> <laughs> so what you're what you're saying what you're saying, Conrad, <laughs> is that teachers don't. They don't produce surplus value. What is it that they do produce? <laughs> well, they Let's produce. Let's go to the panel. <laughs> yeah, they produce. They produce. Uh, uh, like I mean, the thing is, like people, you know, the reproduction of uh, of surplus value requires that certain conditions are furnished that don't fall within the circle of that, right? So, like you know, women's labor is like a very easy example of this, right? Um, women's unpaid labor, I guess you could say. In the sense that those things are not remunerated, but they're non-remuneration. They're not directly remunerated, right? You might marry, obviously, you know, traditionally, like you marry someone and they, you know. But what I'm saying is that there's no direct process of remuneration, right? So it's necessary that we have people to take care of bodies, children, whatever, yeah. right? But, but that's just labor. organized in a different way, right? So I was going to say, Mia Gonzalez has a really good. She has an essay called "The Logic of Gender," and so she talks about how the capitalist economy is organized into what she calls DMM. Uh, directly market mediated activities, IMM indirectly market mediated activities, and then there's a a middle between the two, which is things which are uh, remunerated but they're not productive, like government work. Right. So those are your kind of three yeah. categories. So does that sort of make sense? So if you work if you work if you work yeah. at a government run daycare, you're in the middle category, right? But if you perform if you work at home, then you're in indirect like indirectly market mediated right 
And that, but then if you, yeah. if you have a job where you work for a co private company, you're directly market mediated. Now, now Conrad, <laughs> Chinese custom. Now Conrad, <laughs> um, what's the significance of this? And why, why, why do we need to know the difference between these kinds of labels? I think, I think a lot of people would, would argue about Marxist theory that we don't necessarily, it describes, but it doesn't tell us anything that tells us what to do. So why do we need to know these categories of labor? Okay, well, look Let's at this. Look at this. Right? If, knowledge <laughs> is for, if knowledge is used for production of commodities and the knowledge is produced as an education, isn't that just part of the overall production process? I get why that isn't productive yet. Yeah, but now you're making the mistake that Marx is going to go on and criticize, which is maybe why he criticized it in this chapter, because you're associating all production with like surplus value production, right? Which has to do with the specificity of, of the value form and the bourgeois mode of production, right? Um, so again, like, yes, it is productive. And I, you know, this is why the, the terms productive and unproductive are misleading, right? This is the problem with them. Like, not because they're wrong, but a lot of it just has to do with the way that unproductive sounds pejorative, right? And, you know, it's like, if this stuff is completely essential, then, you know, it can be a mis misleading, that word, right? What do you guys, any thoughts? What do you think? Hmm. There, there was there was noise over here, so I kind of that was louder than m m the speakers, so that distracted me. <laughs> <laughs> I just said that the problem with unproductive this is, is, this is why I'm not, we're not at, we're not we're not at China quality yet. I don't know this in terms of production. Yeah, I just uh, said that unproductive seems pejorative, but you have to like you have to understand that it's yeah. not about production to court; it's about production of surplus value and, and exchange value, right? Yeah. Um, you know. So again, like there is, it is unproductive labor is productive, right? Mm -hmm. It's essential for the valorization of capital, but it's just not directly productive yeah. of surplus value, right? Yeah. Okay. So the idea that the idea that someone might say get a real job doesn't look at the what Hegel might call the super sensible realm, which is the fact that this quote unquote non-real job actually is a necessity to the valorization of what one would call the real job, and, or as STEM uh, majors in college would like to call themselves in the technology field. Thank you, Conrad. <laughs> it may or may not be a necessity, but a lot, of are weirdly, a lot of things are weirdly structured that way, right? So like, think of some guy who just stays at home and collects welfare and like edits Wikipedia. And it's like, Wikipedia, I think, definitely falls under what Marx called the general intellect, like our sciences, our collective knowledge. Um, but yeah. it's not remunerated, right? So in a way, it's like you're you're you know you're doing things that it's it's uh, it's unproductive labor, not remunerated, but it's unproductive labor that actually uh, helps, right? The process of cap the valorization of capital. Because if we yeah. you know if we have better Wikipedia pages, then we know more stuff. That's how it works, right? Yeah. Interesting. So, so we really must be careful of the capitalist tendency to to separate people in central categories and non-essential categories to a certain extent, not just in the COVID crisis, to be, to be uh, cute about the COVID crisis, uh, crisis, crisis. Um, <laughs> but in fact, uh, this tendency to denigrate uh, various aspects of work, I mm -hmm. think you see repeated throughout um, throughout society. Um, and usually the more reactionary will will rely heavier on this tendency to denigrate laborers who they nonetheless rely on to a certain extent. Just because they do not produce directly the surplus value maybe with the hands and the, the head. By the As way, the is Twitch streaming productive labor? Uh, intrinsically, there's no distinction, but uh, it would only be productive labor if you're paid by a private company to do it, right? So, that, or, you know, like, it could be a bit more complicated than that, how you're you're remunerated, but I think you get my point. Um, I want to hear more from the productive labor. Ernesto, do you have... Uh, actually, I guess, I guess Elliot, Elliot, do you work for a private company? I work for... A, so I, work, I, work for I, work, I work for a non-profit. Okay, so that's not really productive labor, is it? Well, it generates money for salaries, but it doesn't. Um, yeah, that's not productive labor. Yeah. <laughs> okay. 
Yeah. Fair enough. I work for a private school. So I'm, mm -hmm. I'm okay. So Elliot and I are, are, sorry, Ernesto and I are productive laborers, but Elliot is not. Ha ha. <laughs> well, I, I'm happy, but exactly. This is, this is the tendency <laughs> that you, you fool. You absolutely <laughs> not see that you nonetheless rely on laborers such as myself <laughs> in order to valorize your productive labor panel. Yeah, I'm, 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 <laughs> I'm the main beneficiary of that, obviously. Um, but, but the thing is, actually, says, I, like how, I like how Elliot is better phrasing his stuff. That's because, thank you, Ender Wigan. This is because I've been watching the top grade Chinese propaganda. <laughs> Practicing. Uh, by the way, actually, my my case is kind of interesting. I, I want to get Ernesto to just because I assume they talk about they're talking about you when they say productive labor, which uh, but though I do do productive labor, so I just want to say something quickly. I work at a school and it's a private school, though it got some public funds to, to help out early on. But uh, basically, there's this weird interaction with the public sector, so they need to get teachers to teach there. But because the standard payment of teachers is relatively high because it's set in relation to the public sector. They have to pay way above what I think a private, um, you know, what a private company with more distance from, um, you know, competition for labor within, within, with the public sector uh, would pay. So actually they're a business. They're like places that just teach business people English in Paris, but they're, they don't pay like they pay like 10, 15 euros an hour, which is, you know, minimum wage essentially. But the real schools, even if they're private, they, you know, they just pay uh, the normal public sector remuneration because they, they want to compete for labor, right? So it's an interesting case of the weird, like, yoking together of these conventions based on... Um, but Ernesto, do you have anything to add? Because someone said they want to hear from you, the productive laborers. So. Hmm. Well, we've noticed that uh, as, a, as a factory, we're part of a generalized uh, process of production, right? Of manufacture. Because if we don't do the job somebody else will be doing it because we're part of a giant chain of uh, mm -hmm. logistics that spans the entire continent right and we've noticed that within our factory certain processes which as you guys say are the productive processes mm -hmm. they 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 of course contribute to the wealth generation but those mm -hmm. people can't do their processes without the help of the non-productive workers in the organization people who are sitting in the office, who are on their computers, the salesmen, the mm -hmm. saleswomen, whoever, they if they aren't participating, we aren't getting a proper valorization. And we've also discussed uh, in terms of how to help people stay in the job, about the kind of compensation that might help people reduce their costs of living, right? It's hard here in Mexico to talk about those kinds of things because we have a government that gives a lot of uh, help to people. We, we have uh, our healthcare, and I, I told you guys that we have uh, different kinds of healthcare. There's the healthcare that you get if you have a job, and then there's a popular, the popular insurance, Seguro Popular, which is a healthcare that you get if you don't have a job, which uh, over the past 10 years, it got got it. Uh, pretty savagely by the government because we had a moderate government, you know, middle of the way, uh, yeah. cu cutting costs, uh, sl slowly um, adding, um, what's the word uh, for this? Uh, when, when you tighten your belt, you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Right, right. Okay. okay, okay. And it's interesting how in different factories that, that plays out here in Mexico. Because for us, uh, something that helped a lot was to reinstate the uh, kitchen, you know, mm -hmm. and having food for, for people. Suddenly, people were, were abandoning their job less. People mm -hmm. were uh, being absent less because, well, first of all, they had food at work. And second of all, they didn't have to uh, take uh, from their wages to pay for the lunches, you know. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. I don't know, I've seen that play out and I think it plays a little bit into this whole creation of surplus value. However, I think that it's, uh, I, I, I think it's interesting how Marx uh, talks explicitly about the contradictions, about, he says that from one standpoint, the distinction between absolute and relative surplus value 
appears to be illusory. Relative surplus value is absolute because it requires the absolute prolongation of the working day beyond the labor time necessary to the existence of the worker himself. Absolute surplus value is relative because it requires a development of the productivity of labor, which will allow the necessary labor time to be restricted to a portion of the working day. So that's what I keep uh, wrapping my head around. Uh, yes, of course, there's uh, certain jobs that create a uh, direct surplus value, but that surplus value cannot be created in on absolute terms without certain factors playing into it from be beforehand, from outside of the productive sphere. So, so it's not simply here. enough to say, say time. Oh, sorry, I, I, I <laughs> took control of the thing and Conrad was to say something. I, I just want to add quickly before you go on, I just want to say just a small theoretical correction. You want to clarify the distinction between productive, unproductive, and absolute and relative surplus value, mm -hmm. right? Um, but also, I just want to say that um, when you talked about people in your company who work mm -hmm. for it, um, you said, well, people who like work on the computers, those are still productive labors. Yeah, of course, of course, of okay, course. Okay. Good, good, good. Yeah. Um, so, but I just want to say, yeah, so about absolute and relative, like, I mean, yeah, so he's saying like, he still acknowledges the difference, but it's just, yeah, it's a dialectical correlation, right? So obviously the, the need to increase the productivity of labor uh, is directly connected to concerns regarding the length of the working day, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, yeah. There's no yeah. way. I, yeah. Yeah, I, well, my example, uh, uh, just, just to clarify, was a misconception that I see happening a lot in my workplace because this is what people say. Like the factory workers say this to the office workers and vice versa. Oh, okay, I understand. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And it just it's interesting to me how in the actual theoretical reality, we see whole more complexity, you know? And of course, as you say, just because they're part of a firm, by default, they're productive laborers, right? And also this, by the way, uh, I just want to say, I do have an answer to this. Uh, Mark says uh, that the capitalist is productive, like, well, whatever, the worker, whatever, the self-employed mm -hmm. worker sure. Say, sure. is productive until such time as they employ other people and remove themselves from uh, the process of production. Right? I mean, so that's what, what makes them a capitalist properly, right? Yeah, a, a, a bourgeoisie, but they can be productive while participating in the labor process, right? As you say, as long as they hire somebody else to also be exploited along, alongside themselves. Yeah, yeah. So for Marx, and I think the whole distinction is a little foggy here, but just to say what Marx says, Marx says, yeah, that... Um, that like a self-employed person would be productive until such time as they're out of the labor process. And and at that point, like they're just deriving what they make from uh, exploiting uh, the the labor of others, right? Mm -hmm. That's the idea. But this, this is kind of interesting. Like what I find interesting about this is like if Steve Jobs gives himself a salary, he's like an employee of the company. Uh, and obviously someone like that is like pretty hands-on in a lot of ways. Um, so that does kind of, that, at that point, it becomes, I think, quite ambiguous, right? Like, I mean, obviously he's not making the iPads in China, mm -hmm. right? But we don't have to, we don't, this is why we don't have to always go directly from Marx. I mean, it's clear that even if, even if Jobs is an employee, he's also different than the other employees insofar as he owns it. But I mean, it would be nice to have some textual context. Um, on yeah, I forget what he talks about Smith. I think it's maybe in theories of surplus value, but he makes the point uh, that I just made. Um, what would Marx call someone who's on benefits? Um, nothing. That, I mean, that doesn't really pertain to the, the, like, because presumably you could be performing productive labor and still be on benefits. Or you could be performing unproductive labor and be on benefits. Or, yeah, exactly. Or you could be Especially performing remunerated like Hypothetically, like an artist, just hypothetically speaking, Kirsty Wood. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, uh, but Elliot, you had something you wanted to say, just to, I didn't mean to. I have, I, that, it's been a bit. I was <laughs> going to ask him. That. <laughs> this is why you got to take notes when you go, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah notes are, no, it's not for good. Thank you, Conrad, the proper PhD student. <laughs> <laughs> the conference, you know. It's good. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're trying to study here, so you have to be professional about it. <laughs> yeah, even if it's unproductive, technically. Um, but it's still but unproductive is that's the thing is we keep going back to that idea, which is a false idea that the, that only the producers of surplus value are are part of the process. Right. So uh, this is actually in, in page 645. He says that the appropriation of surplus labor by capital 
that is the process which constitutes it it forms the general foundation of the capitalist system and the starting point for the production of relative surplus value so i was having a discussion with somebody on i think zero books capital comrades and i said like capital precedes the capitalist mode of production which is pretty mm -hmm. clear in marx's work but he's here saying that capital is used to appropriate surplus labor prior to the capitalist mode of production right but but it's just not generalized like that it's not like it's not mcm money commodity money money as like a general uh mode of production right um so just just to delineate that right so the capital relation presages capitalism um but it's not generalized um but then he makes the distinction between real and formal subsumption of mm -hmm. labor under capital um so just to clarify that i think there's an appendix that deals extensively with that and it's really important to like um uh <clears throat> it's really important to like the uh, post operist Italian stuff because like Negri argues that now ev like we're so subsumed that uh, everything we do, like there's no value, there's no like law of value, like in the sense that everything we do creates value, mm -hmm. right? Which is a bit like it's it's a bit sloppy because then it's like, well, why is Macron trying to? Yeah, we can, but then know, at, at what point does it, if everything we do creates value? Um, he might have, if he further defines it, because I think I have a similar quote unquote uh, sloppy monism, but it, it, it performs a function. So what is he, what is he trying to say when he says everything um, creates value? Uh, yeah. yeah, I just want to say, so, so just to clarify, formal subsumption, and we already talked about this a little bit, we touched on it a bit, but formal subsumption refers to normally when, when capital takes control of an mm. industry, but it's based on absolute surplus value production because it doesn't revolutionize the means of production. So like peasant agriculture, capitalists begin to take surplus value from it. For example, imagine, I don't know, China or something. I don't know if that even happens, but okay, probably not, but okay. Um, then, um, but doesn't change the fundamental labor process or uh, focus on relative surplus value that way. But real subsumption is when capitalism actually penetrates into the labor process and begins revolutionizing and changing. Um, so I just want to clarify that distinction in the mm -hmm. way it's, uh, any thoughts on that or? Yeah. Well, it, it's interesting because I often, I often think about the signifier I chose for the book, a revolutionary proposal. Um, mm -hmm. and of course capital is revolutionizing itself. So it's like, there's so many, um, I think the revolutionary. Here it is yeah. for the audience. <laughs> wow. It's a nice, clean, unbroken cover. Yeah, yeah. I read the uh, digital version. <laughs> Sorry, no, but um, yeah, the <laughs> the, uh, the there's so many different. Um, I think revolution is so thrown. It's so thrown by I think various um, um, activists, protesters, uh, every. Uh, every everywhere and in terms of like what does what is what's the significance of a revolution um in the revolutionary revolutionizing processes versus um the revolution of you know the violent revolution to overthrow a state and i think i think everything sort of has the tendency to to fall into that that second mm -hmm. um idea and away away from marx so it's so it's interesting to hear this dialectic revolutionary process Right. Well, in the case uh, of your book, you're clearly advocating hmm. for a change in the actual process and the method. So, yeah, I, I think that's pretty. And literal. then it's a bit of a guide of how to do it. It's a bit yeah. of a how-to guide. It's like because there's because this this system is so flawed um, in terms of how uh, how psychotherapy measures things and how um, and how insurance uh, actually creates the process of the therapy mm -hmm. and then, uh, to, to this point that there's that there's these I even like outline it's sort of petty someone made fun of me on a review they're like they were like this is pathetic <laughs> talking about insurance like like dealing with insurance why are you writing this right but if he's, he's, he's like look, yeah. he's looking for like the he's he's uh <laughs> hold on hold on hold on Sorry, I, I keep I keep like glancing at the comments and it, it like yeah. So I, I switched away from the comments for a second and then lost my place. What what was I saying? About the review. Oh, yeah, no, you were saying like the, the the process of the of the insurance company is like 
irrelevant because it's not like it's not like a revolution. And then people are like, well, are you talking about revolution or reform? Uh, it's like, and then like the, the but then of course, redu like if you take that logically to the end, you get the absurd picture of an armed revolution of therapists, which is like a total joke, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> which I think um, uh, Jay just made a great question about this. I think it's a great, very yeah. ad hoc. Yeah. Like what businesses would be considered good as Marxist? None or a few. I mean, of course, therapy would would work right within a system, a, a societal system that ran under Marxism, right? We would try to keep people's mental health up. Yeah, interesting about that. And Elliot, you may know about this: is that apparently after the Russian Revolution, they were super into like psychoanalysis. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I think maybe Zizek talks about it, but they had like. They well, these like responded directly to my question about what that. So you might have seen him respond directly to me, but maybe okay. he says it a bunch. He probably says it a bunch. But in terms of um, uh -huh. when I asked, I asked him about um, parallel processes. He eventually he uh, he started talking about the quote, the quote unquote disgusting film Dangerous Method, and um, and uh, you know the first psychoanalytic kindergarten. He called it a disgusting so film. Yeah, he called it a disgusting film. Beautiful. It must be really bad, right? <laughs> it's it's in, it's entertainment, but it's like it's like very like like uh, kind of vulgar. Carl Jung doing BDSM with uh, Kira Knightley. Um. <laughs> I heard that you actually. I heard that it decreases your knowledge about psychoanalysis. Watching it, it's so like whatever knowledge about psychoanalysis you have will be diminished after seeing it. Yeah, it's for close. <laughs> after seeing it, <laughs> Um, this stuff about immaterial labor makes no sense, by the way. Like, I, I don't have, like, the, the post operist stuff to go through right now. But, like, again, I'm going to say this, like, very, very schematically. Like, um, like, why would... It's still, like, a political fight, right? Like, the extension of the working day and all of these things. If immaterial... If value... If the value form didn't hold, or if immaterial labor was being sort of magically and ubiquitously created in the way that it's portrayed in this way... Um, you know, then there would be no reason for those fights because you'd just be like, well, people are going to be creating, you know, creating value anyway. Um, the, 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 point, uh, the point here is that you have to differentiate between, like this criteria blurs the line between productivity and value. Like you have to attempt some kind of differentiation, but you also have to acknowledge that, um, and by the way, when I say productivity, I mean material productivity, not, you have to acknowledge the way that what, we, what Marx calls unproductive labor is crucial to the valorization of capital characteristic of productive labor. So it's mm -hmm. not about like, it's not about uh, assailing the dignity of uh, unproductive labor, right? It's just about understanding that there's like a, a, a complementary structure, right? And also antagonistic structure, but there's there's a a, 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 a dual structure through which uh, the capitalist mode of production functions. Mm -hmm. right? yeah. And, and yeah, this is just, this is just sad, of course. Uh, but um. <clears throat> I was thinking. I, well, I I was thinking. I always think about Fisher, and uh, you know Fisher's suicide, since it it does it does sort of haunt um, the act, and you could say the valorization of depression. And I I'm, I always think of that, and of course I always like intrinsically don't like don't like it as a as a therapist because you're trying to do so much with therapy. And I think I, I often I, I think I often come into conflict uh, with people in, into socialist theory and communist theory about uh, the role of depression, right? And I think the register of depression um, it almost becomes a moot point at a certain point, but I think I think it becomes unified in in people like uh, Fisher um, in terms of like the structural the. the the depression regarding the structural in terms of like, I want to adjust the structure. I don't want, and then the personal depression, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Um, I just want to say here quick, by the way, uh, isn't immaterial labor just a way to describe a subject which is constantly con it's conceived in its relation to production. Again, like I think immaterial labor, I was just going on before, but I think immaterial labor, we're talking about like what cognitive and effective labor, but like, where would you, like, at what point would you say that those things, don't have a relationship to material reality. What is even the use of talking about materiality versus immateriality? Like these are sort of metaphysical tropes, right? Like, I don't really think that, again, we have to try to endeavor. It's one of the hard things about reading Marx. Like we have to try to endeavor to supply a definition of, of 
how materiality is constituted well, historically. Um, yeah. I would argue that, that materiality is a word that's used to refer to uh, like the necessary comprehension of the domain of use value. And then it ends up constituted that way metaphysically. But I just don't consider it useful to say this is material, this is immaterial. I mean, if you if you perform like emotional labor, right? If you take care of kids, right? Those kids like are gonna become workers, right? That's the point as well, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I just find it weird to say, well, emotion, digital stuff, that's immaterial, but is that useful? I don't know. You were talking about depression yeah. though, which is mm -hmm. weird. Yeah, about. no, I think you're, we're talking more about the super sensible qualities of, um, of these, not to use Kegel jargon, I wish there was something else, but it really is it's super sensible in terms of the extended full, uh, and I think people just, people sort of having a, that, that closed view where they take the thing and they see if it, what it produces directly and they don't, they don't, uh, they don't take it as a part of a larger process, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, and I think, I think the thing about the thing, the thing, I think the thing about Fisher is that I think he really, uh, I think there was a real fatalism there in terms of like, you see like capitalist realism comes out in, uh, 2009, it was written in 2009, 2010, I forget exactly the date, 2009, I think. And it's interesting that he's pronounced, he talks about capitalist realism and he subscribes to a broadly sort of post-structuralist view of this, like, oh, you know, capitalism is now totally subsumed reality and there's no easy way out. But it's a bit ironic because the capitalist reality principle was being destabilized even prior to when he wrote that, like in 2007, 2008 with the global recession, right? Um, so I just see someone, I think Fisher was like really, really adept at identifying the problem, but I see him as someone who on a, on a, both a personal and theoretical level, I think there was a real, um, you know, uh, he, I don't, I just don't think he saw a way out, you know, and, and, and maybe you can say, well, it's because he wasn't, you know, emotionally attuned or astute enough to identify it or whatever, you know, but I don't well, he think just directly identified his personal condition with the social condition without any difference to a certain extent well i don't want to be hard I, I mean i think you could also argue that he's just more realistic than all of us in terms of you know um and and it's interesting because that's, that's yeah. the same kind of fatalism you see in in nick land stuff right and they work together right at the ccru but i think also nick like land has a much more green version of it though nick lands yeah. the idea nick lands process mm. is very it's almost like Taoist, which is like no matter what you do and then other Elliot's as bingo. Um, like Nick Land is like intelligence is the is the pro is the is the quality which melts all processes. Uh, you can't contain it. Mm -hmm. um, it has like the more you try to contain it with uh, human ideas, or the more you try to structuralize it, the more it escapes, and the more it'll just melt everything. Um, and eventually, we'll get to the point where AI takes over. <laughs> I think he's talking <laughs> about like social rationality or something, right? Social, ra yeah, social rationality is sort of um, a, a dialectic bunk. Um, the idea that, um, that that there is, I guess you could even say it is there's a process, uh, which is, you know, in, in terms of the ability, as he puts it in a few ways, the ability to win games is intelligence, um, stuff like that, uh, or just IQ or whatever. Um, but that this, this sort of process will, is ultimately so powerful um, that nothing can, can, but the problem is it doesn't, it doesn't show like in terms of what structure, in terms of like intelligence's ability to become part of, you know, the individual worker and then within a structure and then how it's utilized. Cause obviously, um, you know, he's, he's having a field day with COVID because, you know, he's, he says, you know, his whole thing is neat. He says, Neo China rise from the future. He says that in the nineties and people are like, nice mean bro. He said, Neo China, well, Neo China, rise from the future, so fuck you. And people are like, okay, Nick Land's out of his mind. Um, and now, <laughs> 2020, we got, we, got, we got not only the virus from China, but then the, the method of containing the virus. And, the, and then you have the Hong Kong protests and the sort of, mm -hmm. you know, what, you know, the sort of, are we going to go to the direction of democracy? Are we going to go to uh, how... China is handling it, and then the authoritarian view obviously has a much more efficient than dealing with COVID directly. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So, so he's he says, you know, 
I think he wrote a tweet recently that says the more we the more we think we fight against the future of uh, the idea that the future will not be Chinese, the more we're sort of shown that uh, the future will be in fact Chinese. Um, that's there's sort great, of ideal. But there's a great book I'm sure that that could be written like on Nick Land in China. Um, I just want to say though, so about the CCRU, and we're, I want to get back and, and just navigate through the rest of this chapter. We got five more pages after, but. Just about the, the CCRU, um, I think that what I'm saying is I think in Warwick at that time, like in the early 90s, there was so, you know, it's like real matter of organized leftism. And so I think, you know, they adopt a very cynical standpoint in that way. Both Bland and, and Fisher start out criticizing, um, you know, capitalism while acknowledging its inevitability in a certain way, which I think is also like their critique of certain identitarian structures. But the difference, yeah, is that, um, you know, for for Fisher, that metamorphoses into a kind of impossible fatalism. Um, and for Land, it metamorphoses into, um, you know, an act of uh, uh, identification, right, with the capitalist system as being the only means uh, through which, uh, you know, some kind of future horizon uh, is going to be made possible. And in turn, an identification with China. Um, so I think they respond to that, that enclosure of reality by capitalism in different ways, right? Yeah, I really like, it's really interesting to read he has his writings on China, which I like, which is, I think, maybe the least, you can almost say the least reaction. And I don't know if it's the least reactionary, but it's, it, um, but it's just sort of directly engaged. It's just sort of a critique of Looper um, or just yeah. sort of analysis of Looper about a Shanghai time. Mm -hmm. uh, it loops through Shanghai time. Um, and that's like, a, you know, he just, and he talks about it in terms of it's like, well, I want to go to France, and then he and then the guy says to him, "Go to China." And he goes, "What do you mean?" He says, "I'm from the future. Go to China." <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think I think there's something like it is true that Nick Land understands something about China. Uh, you know, he does grasp something that other people do not. Um, and. Yeah. You know, I think there is, I think there is, you know, I think, I think we see like an aspect of like the good old Nick Land, uh, you know, emerging in, in some, in some aspects of those, po those positive assessments, right? I'm not saying all. Can we, can we just jump back a little bit to the chapter to get back on? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So now that, now that Neo China has arrived from the future. Yeah, Neo China has to tell, has to teleport into all of our, our chapters. Um, back, so... back to capital. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we're reading capital even. I mean, come on. Anyway, well, we're reading we're reading capital with an eye to the present. That's that's what people have to understand. Yeah, mm -hmm. Bernie. You know, honestly, honestly, I was a, I was a progressive. I was not. Uh, there are a lot of people that I was a progressive. I was an activist, and I think I was I was I moved towards socialism due mm -hmm. to Bernie. So mm -hmm. that's why I'm kind of a little stupider, maybe than a few of you. <laughs> um, regarding capital, so I'm, I'm sort of figuring this out as a yeah. There are all these tendencies that move move towards uh, move towards the Chinese century. Of course, of course, that's that's idealism because it's you know in a certain in a certain extent the thing that's structurally embedded um, before you know when violent revolutions could happen, Mao could never have taken hold. Mao. If China was a liberal democracy, it would stay a liberal democracy, like forever. Um, I, don't, I don't think people people don't give that enough credit in terms of like in the mid twentieth century, you could have an armed violent revolution. You simply cannot have an armed violent revolution <laughs> in in China at 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 a certain at a certain point, like an intrinsic um, intrinsic like people's revolt. Like you see, like the yellow vest. I would say you have a lot of people out on the street. Not only not only do they not have the technology, but the ideology is so fragmented and much and um, split in terms of like what do they want? Oh, they want you know they want anti. They're like no globalism. They want like tech. It's just all over the place. It's just like um, hmm. yeah. you know, it's it's the demographic. Yeah. It's the demographic of the traditional. And I know, and I know um, we have our we have our resident Ancom here, Jay. <laughs> you said basically, but who who is very good at at maintaining the handcom agency always um, on violent revolution, correct? <laughs> the the Jiajon, I mean, I was here. I participated with the Jiajon in the fifth week. Uh, the Jiajon 
you basically have there the demographic of the traditional PCF French Communist Party, right? You know, in terms of people who are lower income, living in the suburbs, uh, it's more white for certain reasons. But you have like this would even be appropriate to say traditional demographic. People who are lower income living in the suburbs, um, you know, uh, peripheries of France or urban poor, um, you know, and it's really it's like when you go out there, it's like, you know, you see the guys like all drinking at noon and stuff, you know, it's really um but uh the thing is it's it's really ideologically multifarious um because it's not united under a, a coherent banner like that as in the past um and this is why someone like trump is all you know in our present is always going to beat someone like bernie right is because you know bernie is like a, a throwback to this kind of coherent he has a coherent message and a, a fairly you know yeah. but if, if 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 the if people who are frustrated with the system uh are themselves totally internally incoherent right um, you know, uh, uh, nursing conspiracy theories, um, you know, uh, total loss of, of anything like the scientificity of Marx's work and so on, um, you know, divided anarchists, progressives, whatever. Um, it's it, it doesn't, a politician who is one thing one day and another thing the other day, or one thing for five minutes, another thing the next five minutes, is always going to have an advantage over someone who's propounding a, a simple and coherent message, right? Um, so that Not would be my... there's, there's, I think there's a certain set of people that want to hear a coherent message, mm -hmm. whether that coherent message is like general, like NPR sort of propaganda, uh, or <laughs> with, with the, with the, or, you know, or what we do, right? There, there's, so there are people out there, even though it does seem like there, the quantity of people who do buy into incoherence mm -hmm. and conspiracy, uh, are so high right now, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you never know, you never know, especially, you know, like who knows what the world's going to look like in 20 years, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think yeah. we might be surprised. We might be surprised the return to coherence. Yeah. Well, we'll see. I mean, that, you know, I think it does have an effect of, there's an effect in reality. Right. So, so I, and I support it in that way. Um, but I just want to say, so the, the next part of the chapter Marx moves into an, quite an extended, uh, not, ex I mean, a few pages. He talks about the, uh, how we need to differentiate between um, productivity and, and value, right? In the sense that, um, so he talks about uh, the historical past and he, talk he says at that early period, the portion of society that he's talking about um, the dawn of civilization, he says. At that early period, the portion of society that lives on the labor of others is infinitely small compared with the mass of direct producers, right? Um, so again, what he's saying is that most people in this context are directly producing use values, right? Um, so, you know, the value relation, uh, you know, the forcing of people to surrender their sort of surplus labor is not well established. Then he, he interestingly goes a little bit on into Egypt, right? Mm -hmm. And he says that in Egypt, they were able to construct these magnificent monuments, which in the Grinness are imaginary use values, fascinatingly. They're able to construct these they were able to construct these magnificent monuments because the efficiency of their agricultural processes. Um, he talks about how how the efficiency of their agricultural processes bring them to a point where they didn't uh, a lot of they only needed a relatively small amount of labor uh, to meet the needs of subsistence, which freed up other labor, mm -hmm. right? And then they were able to pursue that, right? Um, and then then he goes into uh, after that. Um, he goes into a discussion of uh, like John Stuart Mill, right? Which we should talk about. Uh, so what, yeah. what, he point, what he points out is that like mercantilists, their conception of uh, surplus value was that surplus value is what uh, arises um, when you sell something in a different context for more than you got it in another context, mm -hmm. um, which Marx points out, you know, totally fifth, pretty much yeah. doesn't understand how this, emerges in the labor process. Um, then uh, he talks about how Ricardo came the closest to identifying it, right? Because Ricardo identifies, um, uh, he says about Ricardo, whenever he discusses the productivity of labor, he, seek, he seeks in it not the cause of the existence of surplus value, but the cause that determines the magnitude of that value. So mm -hmm. he understands the relationship between value magnitudes uh, and the productivity of labor. Um, uh, so his school has loudly proclaimed that the productive power of labor is the originating cause of profit. Uh, yeah. So you see there's, there's a relationship in the work of the Ricardian school, uh, 
between the productive power of labor and the notion is posited that's the originating cause of profit. But he says they obfuscate, they never quite get to actually recognizing surplus value mm -hmm. and how it's extracted. So when he goes into discussing Mill, right, he's saying that Mill's basically just copying from, you know, these sort of opaque, this opaque dimension, right, uh, of, uh, it's sort of a Ricardian vulgarization, right? Mm -hmm. So I just, I, we can, we can maybe go into a mill in a second, but does anyone have any, any thoughts on that or? Yeah, I, I started to reread it. Then I started listening. To it. <laughs> and I was like, I shouldn't be rereading this. I should be duration because the cause of profit is that labor produces more than is required for its support. Right. Okay. <laughs> it's obvious. It's obviously missing quite a bit. Um. Yeah, it's, it's like a very vague, it's like a very, very vague, uh, but you know, I mean, I actually think in a certain way that like capital, I think what, Mar what happens is Marx reads Ricardo and then he just like sees in Ricardo this tremendous potential for like left-wing appropriation because mm -hmm. he's like, shit, like Ricardo is relating like the origin of profit to the productivity of labor. So what if, right? What if that shows, right, can be used as a structure to prove, right, uh, that, you know, to, to that socialism is correct, scientifically correct, right? You know, again, insofar as it's the productivity of, of the, or insofar as it's the, 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 la la the commodification of labor power. I'm going to do right? the Chinese cutscene again. Conrad, that's a very important point because you hear so much the phrase scientific socialism, and it's almost a joke at this point. Scientific socialism, even among socialists, is a joke. So tell us, can you can you please explain to me and the rest of the listeners, the rest of the new socialists, the Bernie Sanderites, I don't know. Uh, why is socialism scientific? Well, I think I think that uh, you know it's scientific because it provides a mapping of reality, right? Uh, so when you, that's, that's highly coherent, right? We can use kind of a coherentist approach to this, right? Um, so if you look at something like class struggle, right, that actually allows you, if you think of history as being the history of class struggle, uh, bracketing primitive communism or whatever, that actually allows you to understand well, like the motives and structure of history, right? Um, you know, so it's about, it's about penetrating, uh, uh, you know, understanding the basis of these causal processes, right? And again, like we're talking about conspiracies here, right? So uh, Christie says uh, the hyper-realist dismissal of all this stuff is depressing. I would argue it's depressing because like the hyper-realist dismissal tends to be a reassertion of the power, like capitalist realism as a paragon, right? Um, but you know, Zizek will talk about this, right? Like how like, uh, you know, the, uh, the matrix, you know, he says like, I don't want this sort of division between reality and the matrix. Like I want us to show how uh, reality is already kind of a matrix of it in of itself, mm -hmm. right? So again, when we talk about scientificity, right, um, we're talking about uh, uh, showing the way that uh, the kind of internal truths and causal processes. But you know, it's interesting because a lot of people get frustrated with this from a, a philosophical standpoint. I'm going to borrow a bit from Althusser here. A lot of people get frustrated from a philosophical standpoint because they'll say like, "What is the object of science?" And it's like, "Well, those are fine critiques." But I have to tell you, one thing about science in general is that it always collapses uh, into a philosophical vertigo, right? If you're trying to investigate the causal process of something, that's not a philosophical process, right? So, you know, it's not, it's not fully defensible on the train of philosophy per se, right? Um, you know, again, like the scientific method is not a philosophy. It's a method that produces results, right? You know, Marx's method is a method that produces results. It's a scientific method. Now, we can defend it in certain philosophical ways. Right, but we have to understand that a big part of its authority comes from the fact that it describes reality. Mm -hmm. Right, you know that's. Um, isn't science just a method? Isn't Marx's work just a method? Yeah, you know, I mean that's 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 like you can I mean, again you can talk about theory, but you always have to talk about practice too. Right, you know, and, and the theory Conrad, I think is subordinate to the practice. Conrad, can you talk about Ricardo again and why Ricardo? lays the groundwork for the scientific process. Well, Ricardo, I mean, actually there's a, there's a metaphor that, uh, that Engels talks about, I think in the preface of the second volume of Capital, and he says like that, <clears throat> he talks about um, 
Joseph Priestley and Richard Lavoisier. So this is about the invention of oxygen. So he basically talks about how uh, uh, Priestley like identified oxygen, but he called it like fire air, and he didn't really like nail it down. And then like Lavoisier came around, and he's like, "This is oxygen, right?" And then so I think you can say that about Ricardo and Marx, right? Uh, is that uh, you know Ricardo gets like a kind of general, he's like, "Yeah, the productivity of labor is the basis of profit," uh, but I mean he doesn't like he just he just a lot of the details of it, like he just assumes a labor theory of value is transhistorical, for example. Mm. So they're saying essentially they're changing the theory of fire air to the knowledge of oxygen. Yeah, yeah, that they're making it a scientific, like something that, that is uh, coherent uh, and that allows us to better understand these causal processes, right? But we need to bring back the term scientific socialism today precisely because 99% of what you read is like so intensely unscientific uh, in the left, uh, and so totally remote from, from, you know, a careful reading of Marx, right? This is part of what traditional communist parties did, right? Is that they disseminated that knowledge and made it accessible for people, right? We don't have those resources today and you can see the consequences, right? Except maybe in China, but that's other problems. Well, it's interesting because a lot of times you hear people talk about communist information as simply propagandistic. Or that's the that's the sort of right wing critique, where the general vague critique, which is communists distribute information in order to in order to generate propaganda to accumulate power, but they're but they're actually the scientific process of that is they are actually taking these things that are vague, sort of ideas that are not well thought out, and they're sort of they're they're describing it better. They're, they are doing it. so. So they're in, not wrong. I think. The, I, think, the see, I, think of I think they're. I think of course you'll you'll see both. Um, like did, Conrad, did you? Did, were you the one who met? You were, you messaged me about uh you messaged me about um, North Korea this week, right? What did, what did they or no yeah, someone North else? Korea, North Korea. North Korea declared that <clears throat> their previous their originary leader couldn't actually teleport, uh, which yeah, is part right. of Kim Kim Jong Un's uh, uh, modernization and uh, you know part of his rationalization of the Chinese of the North Korean state. Yeah. Yeah. So it's interesting because I think once once you have a large accumulation of power in a single party, there is a there is this there is this new possibility of extraordinarily uh, inaccurate takes backed by force, right? Um, but I think you're seeing with China. A lot, a lot of times they're they're like you'll if I watch like the Chinese sort of what is it CGTV? It's kind of interesting because you'll get you'll get these takes that are that are, are really economic explanations. They're really laying out the foundation of what they're trying to do, and they'll have various people. They'll yeah. have like British finance person, and they'll have they'll have like the Yale economics person that's talking about the cash injections, which is sort of like neoliberalism, of course. Uh, it, it certainly has flavors of neoliberalism. Um, but in terms of using the state uh, to just heavily sort of invest in these poverty relief methods, um, and to absolutely not have to worry about someone like Donald Trump in China. You simply like do not have to worry about them coming into power uh, if you listen to G G talk, you know you might think G is, you know, if you're anti Chinese, G is like you know, authoritarian. But if you hear if you hear him talk, he at least is trying to do that process, that scientific process, which isn't necessarily causal, but it's like yeah, it has the result of we need to be on the right side of history. Uh, we need to we need mm -hmm. to handle Hong Kong correctly, and you know that is that was a huge contradiction in terms of. It's still a contradiction in terms of um, the American socialist value, which is just so anti-authoritarian. Uh, you talk if you listen to Bernie Bernie Sanders um, talk, he's he is very 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 anti-authoritarian. Of course, the right might argue that taxes are taxes are his authority, um, and, um, and then but well, I think he, he also has to communicate. 
Like, I think his positions in the past are more equivocal, but I think now it's like. You think? Well, you know, possibly. Yeah, yeah. I have heard him. Yeah. Like, but I, th- I think I think he had a more balanced approach. Yeah, the contradiction between American socialism's tendency towards anarchy and Chinese socialism's, uh, it's not even, it doesn't matter what you think about it. It exists. It actually exists, This author- the authority to do socialism, like carte mm-hmm. blanche. Um, it's just such a different environment. Well, um, here's, and- here's a problem, right? So Marx calls, you know, we're getting back to the idea about propaganda versus science, right? Um, you know, uh, Marxism, look, Nathan J. Robinson is propaganda, right? In the sense that it's unscientific. Maybe it has some sort of positive function for the left. Okay. Um, but I said, you know, like you have to look at this this way. It's very easy to dismiss these things, right? As uh, conspiracies or as merely propaganda or misinformation. But like, that's because that these processes, and this is what Marx is pointing out, they're not just visible. They're not just there, right? So it's like, you know, you could think, say the same about the theory of evolution, Right. Like, it's like, you know, th- this reminds me of when of when conservatives are like climate change isn't happening because global warming isn't happening because it just snowed a lot. Right. And it's like <laughs> there's actually like there are actually mechanisms you have to yeah. have to understand how this stuff functions. So it becomes easy to dismiss it as propaganda and ideology. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if either a, you know, you lack the education to see those processes or mm-hmm. B, that you have the education, but you want don't want other people to to figure out what you're doing and you know you know who actually has a really good point about this which is of course he goes a different direction is mencius Mulbug, and i think you know to go like i'm gonna do i'm gonna go full neo-reactionary or shit lore Mm -hmm. reference but um but but this is important because there's a real process of like scientific socialist analysis and then there's the second process of um you could say on the, the more propagandistic like uh you know, playing the crowd. And, and then his example is the way that Americans fought Hitler was they didn't want to just say concentration camps. So they said they're going to take over the world. And, um, you know, he might've actually been, but let's, let's give Moldbug like, let's just say he's correct for a second. I don't know if he's correct, but he said, mm-hmm. he sort of lays out the argument that he says, if he says it's an indisputed fact that the Nazis weren't trying to take over the world and that they wanted an, to be Britain's ally more than anything. I don't know if that's mm-hmm. true. Um, but, but just the idea is important. Um, I want to take over Eastern and Central Europe anyway. Yeah. yeah, exactly. But the way that he that we were brought into the war were not was not that they were killing people. Was that they were going to take over the world, and that was the main reason Americans got dragged into the war because it was like they had all these sort of films written by Dr. Seuss and other people like that saying these are the Nazis taking over the world. Mm-hmm. Um, but they weren't this. They were. It's just not true. Right. It's not wildly, um, it's not wildly implausible that, that like, that's so in this case, it's like, it wasn't true. Um, yeah. But nonetheless, the Holocaust was happening, but because yeah. it couldn't be mobilized to stop it. Um, yeah. We had it's, a, not wildly, come get you to. It, it's not wildly unfeasible that if, if the Japanese had connected with the Germans, which would have required uh, the Germans to beat Russia, which they didn't, um, that they would have taken control basically of Asia and Europe or large, the majority of it. And then on that basis, the other parts of the world would have been threatened subsequently. Um, but yeah, it is. Think, it's going. It's going a little bit off what was immediately happening. Yeah, it's quite. I think bit, the bit argue, I think the, strong, the strongest arguments against China, which based on American spirit or whatever, <laughs> I hope that doesn't sell cigarettes. Um, <laughs> but um, sure people are paying attention to argue. I'm helping yeah, sell yeah. cigarettes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is um, you know, the stuff like they have the companies which monitor. Um, brain waves for work mm-hmm. uh, yeah. And, yeah, yeah. and also the work day. Like in terms of the, these aspects of, the, of, of Chinese work culture, I think are just imminently in themselves arguments um, that something is going wrong in the system, mm-hmm. um, whether or not that's true in that. And I think that's in terms of what, what does America have to bring to this sort of hyper-rational economic analysis? is um, the tendency to avoid that sort of thing, right? To avoid the labor sort of being hyper-coded. They're over-coded to the point where their emotions are like, mm-hmm. uh, they actually, they have the neural nets, right? 
or neuro, like they already have, I think it's called NeuroCap is the actual company, uh, the mm -hmm. Chinese company that monitors uh, worker brain waves. It's some, that's fucking dystopian. Um, <laughs> it's frightening, but I, you know, maybe I think, um, and then you read the defense of it is like, well, they thought we were going to read the minds, but we're, we're not actually reading their minds. We're just seeing if they're angry, if they're sleepy, if they're, it's like, that's a pretty big portion of reading <laughs> that you are literally actually reading their minds, right? Um, their emotion, no state. So I think, um, and you know, you talk to, you talk to, um, people who don't have any political context who are, who would be the, you know, middle class of China and they, and they're, this overcoding really has an emotional toll on them to the point where they just, they want to flee. Mm -hmm. Um, so in terms of what does the American socialist in this one, we can't get power. <laughs> it seems like American socialists just are very, we can't get elected even with this huge grassroots movement, but that's not always true. We have some officials in some cities. Um, I think, I think the American idea of libertarian socialism is essential. Uh, to, to the idea of what what you know, the future we want to build. Yeah, but American socialism conflates, I agree with you, but look, American socialism conflates two things. This is the problem, right? Mm -hmm. What it conflates is like the imperative to reproduce value, right? Which drives, yeah. for example, like uh, like that is the that is the basis of why that's happening in China, for example, right? And American socialism, you know, misrepresents that as a generic struggle for a, a sort of liberal negative freedom, right? And in that way, mm -hmm. it, it embraces All like right. a, a totalizing anti-authoritarian injunction um, that yeah. doesn't actually grasp the relations a relationship of this to economics, right? And that's, that's ideological in that respect. Um, so what I mean is like Marx refers to 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 wage labor as wage slavery, right? Yeah. So it's it's but it's very very interesting how you know very often. Um, American socialists seem more concerned with like, you know, effusively condemning any regime that, you know, could be not nominally called to to totalitarian than with the global yeah. structure of wage slavery. Right. Also, there's um, the question of to what extent, to what extent does the Chinese Communist Party have control over somebody producing these things for uh, companies? I think they probably do to a certain extent. Um, they, they, they like, you know, the information, the more information, the more coding there is the better. So there's this imperative. I think there's there's an imperative in the Chinese socialist socialism with Chinese characteristic structure for more coding, more overcoding mm -hmm. um, of, of the worker. And I think there, the, in terms of like, if I was, if I if I had any authority in China, which I probably only as maybe an enemy <laughs> or something I do. I don't know after after my recent, I, because of my antics or whatever. Um, my, you know, I would focus on this, this overcoding tendency and how to, how to counter it to improve the quality of life of uh, workers and people over there, right? Well, the enrichment of China is good in of itself, like in terms of alleviating poverty and all of this, and that's connected with some of the things the Chinese Communist Party does. But the real question from a bigger Marxist standpoint is, is it possible to view China's uh, embrace of the value form as a means of enrichment, right? Or the normalization of, of the process of the extraction of surplus value as, as still connected in some broad historical sense to the process through which the value form can be overcome? Um, I do believe it is, right? Um, and I believe it is for a range of reasons, right? It's like, you know, when the third world gets rich, you don't have cheap ass third world labor anymore, right? Which plays a pretty instrumental role, right? In maintaining capitalism in relationship to the, the rate of profit and so on. So we can get into all that, right? But I do acknowledge it's a very complex argument, right? But I don't think that we should, you know, I think we have to be nuanced about things. You know, I don't, I don't think you want to go, you know. It's a tendency. It doesn't, it doesn't mean throw it all out, right? Because of the, the tendency. I think it, I think it's, it's, it frightens us intrinsically, but. But in terms of like, look at, there's so many, you know, as Zizek says, when one person says, look at all the people Mao killed, it's like, well, look at what capitalism thing, right? So you can play tit for tat all day. What about Taoism? Mm -hmm. I think um, mm -hmm. it's one thing that li uh, liberal democracy has, which is to a certain extent, a safeguard against this hyper coding. Well, when did, when did, when did socialism become so lame that it became like about measuring, you know, measuring stats as to, to how many people were killed? Like, it's like, you know, socialism comes from republicanism, right? 
like you know with the focus on, it's funny on you say that. i was just thinking about that with i was just thinking the, about marx's correspondence with lincoln yeah well with the focus on with the focus on um positive freedom right mm -hmm. which just doesn't come yeah. easy right lincoln 500,000 people dead in the civil war i think machiavelli yeah. was sitting there being like damn we should really unify italy but you know creating an italian republic well a lot of people would die so we better not do that these are like fundamental to the conditions that actually can create freedom for people right you know and i mean yeah. like how you know to be that like i'm not trying to like diminish the reality of violence well i sort of am but what i mean is like <laughs> that to sit there and kind of bean count out deaths right like the question isn't yeah. creating like, a freer world and one that's better for all people mm -hmm. right yeah and, and anyway yeah. what moral authority does capitalism have to talk about that anyway right yeah. like the question isn't isn't how many isn't you know how many people we that well, we are in capitalism right we are hypothetically we're so yeah. we're we Every are american power. socialist north america we are the north american socialist contingent here we've been kind Every of a world power killed a lot of people <laughs> Every world power killed a lot of people right like again yeah. i consider i consider like obviously the holocaust somewhat exceptional but but i do think that you know whether we're talking about uh nazi germany or the soviet union or the united states you're looking at pretty big death counts right so i think the most valid question is what are they trying to do and who do they stand for? Yeah. Right. And that's Definitely. what that's what made Caesar Borgia right. That's what made Machiavelli right. That's what made Lincoln right. Right. Uh, that's what made Garibaldi right. That's what made you know we could go on. Right. That's what made Marx yeah. right. And that's what made the Soviet Union right. Right. Whatever these awful things that I'm not saying are yeah. good. Right. But the poorest countries mm -hmm. in the world supported the Soviet Union. Ninety one, when the coup was launched by the Soviet military leaders to stop the dissolution of the Soviet Union. You know, look at who supported the coup. Poorest countries in the world supported the coup to stop the dissolution of the Soviet Union. Military coup. Mm -hmm. Richest countries in the world all wanted Gorbachev to dissolve it. That tells you something. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's almost like the history of, it's almost like the his, all history is the history of class struggle. <laughs> <laughs> almost. <laughs> it makes me well, think yeah. of this idea. What do you guys think of my idea? <laughs> it's... <laughs> It's a scientific concept. Yeah. I mean, I just meant you have to see the big picture of these realities, right? Like that that's got that's Marx supported, you know, uh uh you know, the class struggle from from the side of the underprivileged. Um, you know, and, and that's what we have to do. It doesn't mean we can't point out when things are wrong, right? But we mm -hmm. have to have fidelity to that, right? And I think yeah. it can be very decisive to look at who's supporting what, right? The whole the whole discourse of human rights is incredibly abused, right? You know, to violate tool. you know, sure, it is yeah. whatever a human right is. I, I don't it's, really well, know the process of human rights in terms of which is good, in terms of you want to improve, you know, just like G would say, you want to improve the conditions, um, just generally. But yeah. then there's that, that is the, the how it's how it's used, of course, and it is used as a, as a, as a tool to, like you said, abuse that process, abuse that very process. Mm -hmm. We should talk just a tiny bit about the, the critique of Mill. We should just, that was the last yeah, thing absolutely. in the chapter. We should just sure. get, get into that, the, the thing about Mill. Um, we've got some great stuff today, I think. Um, so, uh, if he has fun, but in the latter case, the laborer. So what, again, what the critique of, of Mill basically is here is that Mill uh, doesn't, again, really differentiate between the production of value and uh, productivity. Um, so he says here, uh, like he, he again, he he doesn't understand the difference between historical forms of social production. Uh, I assume Mill says throughout the state of things uh, where the laborers and capitalists are separate classes prevails, with few exceptions, universally, namely that the capitalist advances the whole expenses, including the entire remuneration of la of the labor. Strange optical illusion to see everywhere a situation which as yet exists only exceptionally on earth. And keep in mind, Marx is saying that because capitalism wasn't nearly as big when he wrote that as today. Mm -hmm. But let us proceed. Mill is good enough to make this concession, that he should do so is not a matter of inherent necessity. On the contrary, the labor might wait until the production is complete for all that part of his wages which exceeds mere necessaries. And even for the whole, if he has funds in his hands sufficient for his temporary support. But in the latter case, the labor is to that extent really a capitalist in the concern <laughs> by supplying a supportion of the funds necessary for carrying it on. Mill might as well just have said the worker who advances to himself not only the means of subsistence, but also the means of production, is in reality his own wage laborer, or indeed, that the American peasant is his own slave, because he has forced labor for himself instead of doing it for someone who is his master. <laughs> right. Uh, so you see, he's criticizing like the way that these categories lose their value 
right? When they're like meaninglessly generalized to history to that degree. But he's also pointing out that, uh, you know, in the in our bourgeois society, uh, that there's a, a strong tendency to want to trans-historicize capital. Mm -hmm. And then at the end, of course, he has this scathing burn, right? On, uh, he says, uh, um, he says, uh, uh, and even in the former case, where the worker is a wage laborer to whom the capitalist advances the whole of his means of subsistence, he, the worker, may be looked upon in the same light, i.e. as a capitalist, since contributing his labor at less than the market price, he may be regarded as lending the difference to his employer and receiving it back with interest, etc. In reality, the worker advances his labor gratuitously to the capitalist during, say, one week in order to receive its market price at the end of the week, etc. According to Mill, this makes him into a capitalist. On a level plain, simple mounds look like hills, and the insipid flatness of our present bourgeoisie is to be measured by the altitude of its, quote, great intellects. Um, so, uh, so his basic point there is that the bourgeoisie hasn't moved beyond, hasn't moved beyond Ricardo's failure to actually situate surplus value, right? Or to discover mm -hmm. surplus value. Right, as a as a concept. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> that, I'll give that an absolutely. <laughs> so that's his that so this is this is where he's gonna move into his discussion about so that that's the end of the chapter. Uh, -huh. uh we'll keep I think we can keep talking a little bit, but I just want any thoughts on that, by the way? Any thoughts on the uh the incapacity to situate this is a big thing, right? Marx writes a whole book, you know, which sometimes is just, I think Kautsky brought it brought it to publication but yeah you know all the theories of surplus value mm -hmm. right literally just like you know a thousand pages or whatever it is very long i've read it uh very long uh dealing with like it's dealing with the way that basically classical political economy circles uh around the question of surplus value uh while never being able to identify it mm -hmm. right and this is also the thesis of this is also what uh louis althusser is reading capital deals with right because Althusser's reading capital deals with the idea that Marx's method can, he sort of isolates it in relation to the way that Marx identifies surplus value, right? Um, so, uh, you know, for, again, for Althusser, you have this kind of Spinozist idea, right? That uh, you have to go beyond like the immediacy of something, right? To, this is what I was saying, right? To acquire knowledge of it that isn't just there on the surface, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that, that uh, again, the classical political economy uh, the problem with it is it represents things in their present form, but as Marx is pointing out here, it, it universalizes and generalizes them because it doesn't understand the essence of what they are. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so th this is very connected. Again, like Althusser, the idea of, of Marxist science and all of this, socialist science, so scientific socialism, whatever, uh, very, very, it gets a really... Uh, can get a bad rap today. And I, I don't think I've, I almost meet, never meet anyone who actually understands Althusser. I meet a lot of people who bash him. I almost, I meet almost no one who's actually read and understood his work. Um, admittedly, well, it is kind of hard. Sorry? He, he didn't really do great PR for himself either. <laughs> in the end. <laughs> yeah, he killed his wife. Um, which, yeah, that's not a good look. <laughs> um, mm. And then he was like sort of sheltered from severe I think he, I think he might have been telling the truth. Um, I've heard I've heard people with similar episodes where they hit their where they'll hit their partner in their sleep. They'll have night they'll have night terrors so intense that they will do something blacked out. Well, this so happened I don't in think his office, office, by the way, in the day. In the, in that he woke and just choked her to death. Uh, it happened in, in his office in the day at the Rude Elm, I think. Oh, did it? Why yeah. did I think that was? <laughs> what? But he claimed he went into like Why a boat. He that? claimed he couldn't I'm remember sure it. Right? That, that he did it after, like at, he did it in, during the day. He says he didn't remember it. Which he said, possible. yeah, he says he didn't remember it, but it happened at his office at the, at the, the Sorbonne, I believe. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't know. I don't know, but yeah, and I can't really, I, I don't want to speculate uh, about that, but, uh, you know, I actually, I went to uh, an evaluation of, they did like a post me to evaluation of Althusser at HM and they made a few. Hey, what did we do? Oh, Althusser. <laughs> They said, "Oh, he was like, I was like, what we do, and a resident and calm, keeping keeping us keeping us uh, unproblematic." <laughs> I was like, Can "You say something misogynistic?" No, well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, they did a they did a they did a discussion about this, like a post me to discussion about this, and they made a few points about Althusser, uh, and I guess the essence of those points were that uh, were like one that his 
um, that he never, there's no misogyny in his written work. That two, that is like, he, he, he didn't have like a long, there's no like recorded long history of violence. He had a mistress who was Italian, but obviously this is, you know, in the time it's kind of banal. Um, and three, they pointed out that he's not really the economic beneficiary, obviously, of his work now. Um, so the, the, there was a qualified argument for the fact that we don't have to like stop reading Althusser. Um, mm -hmm. You know, like this is obviously a side somewhat, you know, given th like the thing about Althusser is there's not really much of a relationship between that stuff and anything he wrote, right? Um, you'd really have to get to like the depths of psychologizing to try to do that. Uh, so I think when it comes to the integrity of his ideas, you know, I'm not saying they're always right. He has terrible readings of Hegel. Uh, certain aspects of Marx, like the value form, he totally messes up, right? Um, I don't know how you can be so good on surplus value and so bad on the value form. It's kind of phenomenal. Um, but uh, I just mean that it's a really, really great theoretical resource. And and I think the tendency to attack it and dismiss it is unfortunate. And a lot of it has to do with the fact that we're in like the great age of English speaking Marxist vulgarization now uh, because of the, uh, you know, basically like the DSA stuff, right? But these sure. people, like a lot of them like, like, Nathan J. Robinson, they obviously have no training in dialectics, no training in European yeah, politics. Yes, it depresses me every single time. It's so depressing. At first, the depression was like a meme, and I was like, yeah, whatever. Mm -hmm. But then, like, it actually started, like, I heard other people talk about it, and I think it, the more I, the more it's just like, oh, boy. It really is like, um, it's, it's just so, so unprofessional. And I mean that in a very real sense. It's like the, the, un, the unprofessional nature of the DSA, I think I think AOC does it best, but even she sort of sublates the tendency into professionalism of like Margarita AOC on Instagram or whatever. But I think to the to the extent of the inability to produce a professional um, result, uh, I think I think is a big problem with the D, uh, DSA. What did you think of, I think this is connected with Angela Nagel's article, because Nagel wrote an article, and what, okay, we're zero books basement, so I guess we should discuss this. Nagel wrote an article, and she basically said that uh, she attributed the failure of the San Sanders campaign to its uh, unwillingness to adopt social positions that were congenial to uh, the working class, right? Okay. Well, uh, I would which, say the Geist, yeah. The Geist, the Geist that um, it's carrying is like this, it's, it's, it's social change, it's that twofold, it's, the problem is it's that it's that uh, dyad between it's like what you need and it's sublating every single centrist, commonsensical, bad take along with it. Mm -hmm. And it's just people see it and they say, what is that monster DSA? Uh, we don't want anything to do with that, especially. And they're really and then some members are like really like, you know, he heavy on the abstract, uh, you know, antagonistic stuff that doesn't necessarily help. Um, mm -hmm. Well, the failure of these groups isn't necessarily for la for total lack of scientificity. Like we're talking about a renewal of of Marxist thought in some ways. I said there is a vulgarization yeah, going on. We've got it better than But uh, but I just want to say the problem the problem is I see it plays out at the level of strategy. We don't have like an organized working class that supports you know like like you know where the, like I said in France you have a big process right with the formation of an organization of the PCF that supports a lot of these ideas right. So mm -hmm. the question you always have to ask yourself is like you know. Um, are we like, uh, to what extent uh, do you have to go to where people are at in terms of what they believe, right? Or to what extent do you stick to the more scientific proposition? And then some of the ostensibly scientific propositions posited by the DSA aren't even really scientific, but okay, right? Um, and I think the problem here, again- uh, I like abolish prisons is my like personal least favorite DSA common <laughs> position. Or like DSA Los Angeles, you know, I was so fucking mad when I saw that they they said for can't for for sheriff they said we don't we don't run a sheriff because there are no good cops. I oh, said, well, Jesus. fuck you then. You know, you're not a, they, you're not a political party. You're a bunch of fucking idiots. Um, it's just so stupid. Yeah, well, and this is so. This is what I mean. You can see it with momentum in the UK. It was like momentum that partly pushed Corbyn to reject to take to to uh, abandon his like. Uh, there are other factors like the dramatic ascent of the Lib Dems and so forth. But momentum certainly was part of what pushed him uh, to abandon his uh, Norway style Brexit sort of approach. They did very well with in 2017, mm -hmm. right? And it's like, of course, it's because the demographic of the people who supports these organizations is disproportionately young, urban, educated, and so on, right? Yeah. But I'm saying the problem gets when these people actually, uh, when they don't 
or aren't willing to make the necessary concessions to appeal to a, a general because because if you want to have a socialist group, you have to have working class people. Mm -hmm. Of course, period. You know, yeah. and that means you. That means you, they come to you, and it means you go to them. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Also, you know, you know it's so like you no, know, it's so mindless regarding like if you go to the parts of lot like so the DSALA. I'm sorry. I'm like so. I, I was so. I still like. I'm like still mind blown. They said write in the funniest answer for sheriff because there are no good cops. I'm, but and if you go to South LA, um, you know the the dichotomy. It's not so simple. There's the A cab tendency there, but it's not. But it's like there's also like um, people are sort of escaping poverty, and they're they're sort of they're sort of um, there's a very complicated relationship between what it means to be a cop or who is a cop or working with the judicial system. And, you know, and simultaneously there's, there's definitely the guy stuff. You simply don't talk to cops. That's, that's universal. That's universal property, which you don't talk to cops, but it's not so simple that it's like that there, that it's not a cap. It's more, it's a lot more subtle. Um, and, and then, and then I, I go to the, like, I'll go to the meetings and I'd be like, Hey, I work in the, you know, I work in the poorest part of Los Angeles. Let's talk about it. They're like, well, that's kind of interesting and stuff like that. And like, nobody knows what the fuck I'm talking about. Um, well, this is the problem, right? <laughs> this is the problem, right? Like, cop, yeah. you know, police, we can say like police are, are bad or whatever, but the reality is like, we live in a world where alienation exists. Right. Yeah. And, you know, you can't, you know the solution like you, you can't just abolish police like tomorrow it does that it's it's it doesn't make work. sense it also yeah. doesn't make it simply is nonsensical so the question is this the question is developing approaches to law enforcement that are sensitive to these issues mm -hmm. right? yeah um you know and and that that's what needs to be pursued right by any political organization right rather than just uh putting forth uh these sort of bromides just a quick digression. Uh, thoughts on wealth of nations as complementary remarks and other economic literature in general. Um, the the uh, Ricardo's um, what's it? Uh, Ricardo the sorry, these books have terrible names. Uh, wait one second. What's the name of Ricardo? The Principles of Political Economy, right? That's the name of it. Which I've read. The Principles of Political Economy and uh, the Wealth of Nations are as certainly as important to capital as as the work of Hegel. Um, so. Uh, and I was saying before that we were talking, actually discussing before, I don't know if you were here, Kevin, but we were saying that um, in a way, Marx's capital arises, I would argue, uh, because he sees the potentiality uh, in Ricardo's identification of uh, the productivity of labor uh, with the production of profit uh, to actually co-op that for a kind of left wing uh, uh, interpretation. So, you know, we could go over all day and discuss like the, the, the you know, the points of overlap and difference. Um, but you absolutely have to read uh, Smith uh, and Ricardo uh, if you're trying to, you know, if you really want to deeply understand capital. Not, not, you know, you can understand it without that. But if you want to really, really get into like a, a deep level, I think that really helps. Yeah. I was identified as a worker. Nor, no, how does actual communication? Then Andrew Wigan gives a nice answer. It's image based, which is, and, and then Kirsty says, what? This is like this is how the buggers in the in, in Ender's game talk in the case. Anyway, sorry, I need it. I need to not. <laughs> I can't invest in these comments back and forth. By the way, I have to interject this. Did you see Biden when he did, like Ernesto? Did you see this when Biden? I, I couldn't believe it. What? 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 <laughs> You didn't hear about what happened with Biden? Well, he, like he said to some guy that if he wasn't voting for him, he wasn't black. Well, he said that he didn't say exactly that, he, but yeah, close. He said. Uh, he said, I got to tell you, uh, you know, if, if, if you have a hard time deciding whether to vote for Trump, for Trump or me, then you ain't black. Right? Yeah, 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 that's pretty much based. Uh, that's because so, his experiences with Obama, you know, his like experience of what black America means is with like Barack Obama, like <laughs> <laughs> rather than like working in black communities. Yeah. Well, I think I think with I think with uh, uh you know, it's good he kind of finally went on the Breakfast Club because, like, I think the guy who hosted it made the point that uh, Charlemagne or whatever he made the point that, like, Sanders or sorry, uh, uh, Biden is basically where he is because of black people, uh, which is basically true, uh, and that's a really interesting thing to get into and try to understand as well. Like, what happened with Jim Clyburn, yeah. South Carolina, um, the black wave for for 
uh, Biden, though not the youngest black voters, to be clear. Mm-hmm. Um, and we should note that Sanders got the endorsement of um, uh, a couple of the uh, the major uh, civil rights leaders. Um, what's the guy who ran the uh, the who ran as a um, uh, uh, an anti-establishment candidate in the '80s in the Democratic Party, a civil rights leader? Um, you know what I'm talking about? Anyway, um, but uh, Jesse Jackson. Jesse Jackson. Yeah, and he also got uh, another guy. Uh, I, it's terrible. I forget these names, but anyway, um, who's very, very another guy who criticizes rap music. You, you get the Canada pass. <laughs> uh, little, little Wayne called one of the guys who endorsed him just another Don King right. with a perm in response to his criticism of rap music. Um, yeah. But I think I think the thing about this is like you know if you look at civil rights and the history of that, mm-hmm. um, you know, uh, I think that in a lot of uh, in a lot of black communities, I think. Um, you know, there's a real, because it's not, this isn't like Europe where parties are constantly shifting. I mean, of course you can say like, oh, well, the Democrat Republican thing kind of inverts itself historically, but there's a relative continuity. Like in in a European context, often you see parties changing really quickly. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I think there's a tremendous, you know, if if you ask Americans, is America getting better? Most women say it is, most black people say it is, most white men say it's getting worse, right? So that, that, what that tells you is that whatever the difficulties black communities have had, that there's a certain social optimism about the directions that have that have the direction that's taken hold in America, qualified optimism about the direction that's taken hold in America uh, since the Civil Rights, at least since the Civil Rights Act. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think that tells you is that that you know a lot of those voters do think th- think something good has happened, and they attribute a lot of that good, again, civil rights being this extremely important moment, uh, to the Democratic Party, right? Mm-hmm. In spite of missteps, which I'm sure they're capable of identifying, right? Um, so. Uh, you know, I think that in a way, you know, for for Sanders to to to, to wage a two pronged war, right, against the Democratic establishment and against Trump, right, um, there's a risk Let's there for black mind. voters because there's a disidentification with the legacy of the Democratic Party that is, I think, valued in a real way. There's a lot of there's tons of black community leaders who are deeply identifiable with the Democratic establishment. Um, you know, it's very very entrenched, right. So I think what people are saying is like, let's get rid of Trump and then we can we can talk about the other stuff later, maybe. I, you know, I don't think I don't think these people are necessarily hostile to Sanders' propositions, right? We saw that with black voters when they polled them; they supported Sanders' propositions, but they supported Biden, right? Jacobin joked that that there's tons of quote Biden socialists, right, based on this this mm-hmm. discrepancy. Um, so uh, that would be my uh, my thoughts on that. Very, yeah, I appreciate very your I appreciate your distance from the U.S., Conrad, because you get caught in the guys. I'm certainly caught. I would say. In the various guides, America's getting worse and stuff like that, and and then we have these little discussions, and I I sort of I, I sort of briefly come back to Sandy. <laughs> <laughs> obviously, there are obviously there are, obviously, there are good, obviously there are there are good things. I mean, I think I think we can say two things in America that have gotten better. One, education, way broader now than in the past, right? And and mm-hmm. and that's continued you know, to, to, to bro- access to education has continued to broaden throughout the neoliberal era, mm-hmm. right? Um, because, you know, ultimately, you know, it's very unscientific often when people talk about the relationship of payment for tuition to like accessibility. I mean, there's a relationship, but look, at the same time, by any, you know, in most cases, whatever you're paying for tuition is far below how that's going to affect your lifetime earnings. So even if you have to take a loan to get it and it's a lot of money, people are still going to do it, right? If those loans are available. But the other thing is, yeah, obviously, when you look at certain issues connected to race and, and gender and so forth, um, you know, there's been a, there's been a lot of progress. So there's there's definitely things we can look at, you know, where progress has continued throughout the neoliberal era. Jay says Charlemagne is usually right. You know, I actually picked up his auto bio like a while ago on a whim. And then mm-hmm. when I heard it was him, I was like, holy shit. I'm glad I randomly picked that up at Barnes. Did you thought you actually got the real autobiography of Charlemagne, and then it just turned out Charlemagne the God, Charlemagne the God, not okay. Charlemagne. Yeah, <laughs> Charlemagne the God is the guy, and I I randomly read his autobiography, and um, mm-hmm. he <laughs> he um, I love the way he tells stories because he's like, so this person told me he like doesn't really he doesn't like try to like philosophize. He's like, I heard this. He's like, I heard this, and this is in a song. I heard this and I heard this. <laughs> it's, it's it's interesting. It's like style. 
it's definitely different than like me. I'm like trying to figure out the world. I'm like sitting like, I'm, like, okay, what, what's the most rad? And then Charlamagne just like, I heard this, I heard this, I heard this. I like this song. I like this song. I heard this. So I like. So then for Biden, and then when I heard Biden said that to him, I was just like, oh fuck. <laughs> Yeah, well, and the thing is, the problem with it is that it confirms what, like, it, it confirms exactly what Charlemagne, you know, because Charlemagne was a little bit critical of Biden earlier, right? Um, basically, for kind of, you know, receiving a lot of the black vote, but not being accountable enough in terms of addressing questions about his own record mm -hmm. and maybe taking for, that for granted. And for him to go on and say something like that, right, can, confirms this perception, right? That he just, he just thinks, like, you know, if you're black, you support me, right? Not Trump. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm sure that's that's likely to be the case, but I don't think that it's like a great. And you want to know something politically thing. active Black Americans that I know in South LA? Guess what? The right wing. Um, <laughs> that's that's the fucking truth. The ones who care that I've met, people who are politically active. Don't get me wrong. I'm sure there's like a contingent, but just like sort of walking around, it's like, look, you know, the geist is you got, you know. It's like, what, what are you doing to make money? Good for you. You're bringing yourself up in the world. Mm -hmm. You got to work hard. That's, that's, you know, because you see, you see people around you, you know, dying from gang violence. You see people around you uh, in domestic uh, DV situations. You see people around you, uh, you know, getting pimped. Um, so you work hard and you, you avoid that. Mm -hmm. And that's, um, so... Yeah, Biden is totally fucking clueless on that. Doesn't mean you shouldn't vote for him, but it's just, but it's really just, um, he just doesn't know what's happening. Well, it's yeah. interesting. Someone, it's been noted before <laughs> that a lot of the values that that Republicans have are similar to the values gangster rappers have, right? Yeah. Uh, yes. You, you, you know, you, you, you engage. You know, it's a fetishization of uh, unbridled material accumulation. You know, remaining, you know, remaining loyal to like your family and your immediate friends. Um, if you want to know, know something. Like, this love of firearms. If I could just interrupt you for a second, Conrad. Yeah. Um, one of the issues is when I talk with people, like for instance, trying to unionize, um, one of the big issues is like, man, if you're surviving and you have a job, just don't piss anyone off. It's like, don't, and, and don't be, you know, it's like, so it's, it, I think people are, uh, people who might be like, they're like, oh, I'm, I believe in right wing values or whatever, you know, you might talk with them and they're like, yeah, fuck yeah, let's do it. It's not like, it's, it's not a difficult operation, but I think, um, I think you have to be sensitive to the risk involved. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Uh, that people are facing in those communities. But about this. So yeah, like this is, this is fair enough, I think. But the thing is, it's actually in a way, obviously someone like Biden should be very thankful that the. Republican Party is so openly racist um, because, you know, uh, I think what happens is that, well, you, like, again, you're talking about a Republican contingent, like statistically, this impulse that we're describing, right, about uh, hustle culture or whatever, it doesn't it doesn't translate, uh, you know, valorizing material accumulation. It doesn't translate uh, into a like a huge number of black Republican votes. Right. And I think that reason is because, again, it's just like the fairly unambiguous character of the Republican Party on these things. Now, a few years ago, the Conservative Party of Canada, uh, before this, like the, the alt right zeitgeist did quite reach what it is, they were really trying to reach out to minority voters on the basis. And I think the right could have success in that. But I think what we've seen more recently is that they've, you know, a, a, a tendency to try to appeal uh, to the, the alienation of white of certain white voters and demographics. Uh, especially less educated ones, um, rather than to focusing on uh, broadening their support amongst minorities, which is, it would be a longer process, mm -hmm. right? Um, uh, so again, like in France, you could say the same thing about Muslims in France, right? Like North Africans mostly, um, that, you know, you, like there is this like kind of, um, you know, a lot of them, they don't go to like the necessarily the most fancy schools. A lot of them are more technical education. They're more focused in on, you know, developing, you uh, traits or focusing in areas that are that are more likely to lead to material accumulation and so on. Um, but they don't they just don't vote for the right. And even more so actually in France, because the right here is probably even more openly racist in the States, maybe. I don't know how to compare that. But uh like I think 80 to 90 percent of uh French Muslims at, in any given election will vote for the left. Right? Um so and usually they they congregate around the most 
viable left-wing candidate. And that's actually interesting too, right? Because in France, you had you had uh, the Parti Socialiste, which is fairly centrist, and, and Muslim voters voted for them. But then Mélenchon, the far left, became the most viable left candidate at some point. And all the, the Muslims very quickly went over to Mélenchon. So I think that what that shows you is that if someone like Bernie were legitimized, right, by the mm -hmm. democratic establishment, that there'd be no problem, um, you know, pick, picking up, maybe even enlarging. Far, it's, right? yeah, sure. yeah, I think you got once, well, once you got, you could almost say it's the union of those who have power. It's, it's simply, he's not part of the union. It's like the same thing as a union worker. You mm -hmm. don't want to mm -hmm. allow the non-union worker on your set. Um, yeah. You don't want to, it's, it's really that simple. It's unfortunate because I've thought a lot about this tendency of no matter, no matter how big the game you're playing, is ultimately you have these sort of small unions, uh, mm -hmm. formations, communities, even if you are playing with the lives of 300 million people. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's unfortunate, the, this, this particular side effect, the union of the grand bourgeois here, the Democratic Party. Yeah, and it's pretty sad that the Democrats are uh, placing all their bets on the fact that that legitimization is the only thing they need to win. Because... Biden barely has any actual substance to his, to his, uh, I guess, um, candidacy. Uh, yeah. Other, he's just like I'm Democrat. Yeah, Obama. I'm the Democrat. And I'm, I'm not the, Trump. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, yeah, but, yeah. But let's be clear that there, there are. It's not that that's a totally impotent strategy. Like you know, the DSA and stuff. They probably underestimate. You know. Like the, the up, you know, for obvious reasons, I don't think they, they draw attention so much to the strengths of that strategy, but you know, mm -hmm. it, it is less divisive in certain respects as mm -hmm. regards the, the immediate climate. Um, and we can look, what, what can you say about Sanders? His voter turnout break, the breakout didn't happen. Right. I mean, yeah. I'm sorry, like the left doesn't deserve to win under the current conditions, you know, until they figure out how to, well, how to mobilize people. I think I mean, there's a material death count that will happen at this point. Yeah. At this point, the, right. The, but I mean, in the past before yeah. Corona, that might not even that. be the case because that, you know it might not even be the case. There might materially there might be um, before there's a change in power, there might be a vaccine. Uh, I want to say, by the way, this about most Muslim and Indian immigrants. I'd have to pour over the statistics for uh, the UK, but I just got through Thomas Piketty's Capital and Ideology, and most visible minorities in the UK, uh, the vast majority, do vote for Labour. Um, so, but that I think there's sometimes there's a bit of a sometimes particular groups can develop a relationship with a certain party. I think what happened in, in the UK, you see this with like my beautiful Andrette, was that uh, you got a lot of immigrants who were quite ambitious who came over. And I think that uh, there was a certain destratification that happened with Thatcherism in which uh, it kind of uh, lower tax policies and everything. It kind of opened up. Uh, you were talking about these unions, right, Elliot? It kind of opened up. The union uh, of the grand, well, I'm taking that from Zizek. Zizek is like the union of the bourgeois, but this particular union I'm talking is not something Zizek talked about in terms of the grand bourgeois, the Democratic Party. Um, you know, unions are unions are real. They're a force, mm -hmm. and, and you know, if you read Sterner, Sterner talks about the union of egoists. It's like they don't they're not intrinsically ideal ideological. And MK uh, who wrote the article about leftists flaking in unions at the best and being actively detrimental to unions at worst uh, because of immaturity. And I felt so, I read that article, like I said this earlier, maybe, which I, I saw the MK article and I was like, oh shit. <laughs> I was like, well, at least I didn't, I, I only, I, I was there partially, <laughs> but I didn't actively subvert it. But, but that's something very important because, you know, and what is there to learn about maybe the Chinese, from the Chinese Communist Party, if not the overcoding that would be totally unacceptable to the American um, psyche. Um, the mm -hmm. the simple professionalism you know the what is what does professional socialism look like and sound like mm -hmm. right at the highest level and that's 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 you know that's why i like cgtv <laughs> no but it's true because uh, i'll i'll give you an example here in mexico we uh we have a left wing president and we talked about this uh, last time. He not all of his policies are actual socialism, professional socialism, so to speak. A lot of them are professional neoliberalism and nothing else. Yeah, yeah. 
And that, that, yeah, that's, that's, and it's also a risk, right? That like, if we're talking about professionalism, you have to be careful about how you define that, right? Because people usually yeah. do professionalism with it's like a thin line reproachment with, with, but about this, just, just on this. Um, yeah. So you see this in the film, my beautiful laundrette with Daniel Day-Lewis, like mm -hmm. the, the Indian family in that, uh, hey, Connor, yeah. before, you, before you go, I just want to be, I'm going to double down on this and be a Jordan Peterson for a second. Sure. Um, hold up. Left is social. Be more professional. Fuck you. <laughs> I don't care. Fuck you. Be more professional. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> uh, about this, what I was trying to get at was just that I think that in the 80s, with the neoliberalization of the UK, that uh, certain corridors of financial power were accessed, or capitalist power were accessed by immigrants because of this destratification. So certain, like you can see this, like there's certain people, like I think in the concert, the minister, Pretty Patel, like in the uh, in Johnson's Conservative Party, um, but there are certain usually uh, somewhat privileged uh, group members of groups who come from abroad um, who are highly ambitious uh, and usually have certain forms of professional training, and they sometimes associate again like the lowering of tax policies uh, and neoliberalization uh, with creating opportunities for material procreation that would be harder to access or facilitate uh, in the context of a more redistributive order. Right. And for them, that may out outweigh certain concerns about xenophobic sentiments within a right-wing party, for example. Uh, someone has a question for you, Elliot. What's that big philosophy book in the background? It's actually illustrative uh, historical philosophy um, book. It just sort of goes through various uh, philosophers. Uh, it's, it's, it's pretty interesting. It's 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 takes on Hegel and Kant are not great, oh. Oh. <laughs> but but it is it does outline a lot of different theories and then you could you could look look it up from there if you're mm. interested. Yeah. It's I think it's called Philosophy and Illustrated History or something like that. Yeah. Should we uh should we adjourn because we have we have two uh, two hours one yeah. minute now? Elliot bookshelf tour. Oh, do you want to do you want to give them a bookshelf tour, Elliot? Elliot bookshelf tour before we adjourn. Well, I yeah, actually this is organized. It's super slop now because I'm writing, so my Hegel's all over the place. But it used to, I used to have top shelf books in terms of like the books that I thought were the, you should read, and I'd hand them to people. And then I would have a philosophy, top sh um, kind of higher shelf philosophy books, and then I have my psychology section, and then I have miscellaneous. And then, but it's it's since gone a little, you know, it's like a little all over the place. That book just kind of looks nice, <laughs> mm -hmm. so it's yeah. up there. Um, yeah, but yeah, that's, I have, you know, I have, I have Freud here. I have this night. I have this great. I like, I like this a lot, which I got, I got gifted from a radical behaviorist, which is like the opposite of me. And we would always talk. And thanks for, thanks for always being willing to chop it up at a deeper level. Here's one of my favorites. Hope it reveals deeper truths to you as it has to me. All the best AJ. And you know what I said about, what I said about active, um, Black Americans being right wing. This is an active left wing psychotherapist. Black American. So, so let's. So I want to negate that because AJ is fucking cool. Where did he come from? <laughs> My bullshit. Where does he come from? So, the guy who gave you that? He's from Kansas City. Oh really? Okay. He lives in LA though. Yeah, he's from Kansas City. And also, okay. we talk about Tech Nine because people from Kansas City like Tech Nine, and he's like. One of the rappers I think white people are more familiar with, mm. typically, <laughs> um, just because he's like very like fast and like sort of immediately appealing. Um, yeah. Okay. Any closing comments? Do we have any closing comments from anyone? Anything you want to say, Ernesto or Elliot? Anything you wanna you wanna add? I'm good. Okay. Elliot, anything? No. Okay. All right. Well, this has been Zero Books Basement, uh, and today. Uh, we discussed uh, chapter 16 uh, of Capital Volume 1, the production of absolute and relative surplus value. Uh, we'll be back next week. We'll be dealing with uh, chapter 17, changes of magnitude in the price of labor power and in surplus value. And in the Folks Penguin edition of Capital Volume 1, uh, that runs from page 655 uh, over to page 667. So another pretty short one. Um, so hopefully we'll see you guys next week uh, and we'll talk about that. Uh, thanks for coming out. We love you all and good day. Bye.